In this video, I'll cover thermodynamics and spontaneity. Thermodynamics predicts whether a process will occur under the given conditions. Processes that will occur are called spontaneous. Those that will only occur with outside energy input are called non-spontaneous. Spontaneity is determined by comparing the chemical potential energy of the system before the reaction with the free energy of the system after the reaction. If the system after the reaction has less potential energy than before the reaction, the reaction is thermodynamically favorable, and therefore we can say it is spontaneous. So spontaneity doesn't have to do with whether or not a reaction is fast or slow, um, and some spontaneous reactions occur quickly and some spontaneous reactions occur slowly. It has to do with whether or not that reaction will occur all by itself, or whether outside intervention or outside energy is required in order for that, um, that process to occur. So one easy way, a simple system to think about um, in terms of spontaneity is a ball that's on a hill. So if we think about a ball on a hill, um, maybe between two hills, so a ball that's in this situation, is going to roll downhill, right, until it gets down here at the bottom. When the ball is at the bottom, it's not going to roll back up the hill by itself. It won't go up the hill by itself without outside intervention. So going up the hill, we call that non-spontaneous. It's not as though the ball cannot go up the hill. It, it certainly is physically possible, but it can't go up the hill all by itself. Something has to push it up the hill. Balls can roll down hills all by themselves. We call those processes spontaneous. So this analogy, we can use this kind of analogy when we think about spontaneous and non-spontaneous chemical reactions. A spontaneous reaction is one that will occur without outside energy and a non-spontaneous reaction is one that requires outside energy in order to occur. Any spontaneous process is irreversible because there is a net release of energy when it proceeds in that direction. So because we're losing energy when the reaction goes from reactants to products, um, then it cannot, uh, the, the reverse reaction would require an input of energy, and any reaction that requires an input of energy we would call not spontaneous. So spontaneous reactions are only spontaneous in one direction. The ball can't roll down the hill and then roll all back up the hill by itself. It can only go one direction. So for example, we think about this, um, this chemical process iron turning to rust. Iron can turn to rust and when it does some energy is lost and the rust does not spontaneously turn back into iron. All iron in nature is spontaneously becoming rust but there is not any rust in nature that is spontaneously becoming iron. And that's not to say that we cannot turn rust back into iron. Rust is iron oxide. We can remove the oxygen atoms from iron oxide to create solid iron metal again. That's, a, that's certainly a possible and even easy chemical process, but it requires energy. In order to remove those oxygen atoms from iron, we have to put energy into the system. Therefore, we're pushing the ball up the hill. Therefore, it's non-spontaneous. If I have pure iron, those oxygen atoms will fit themselves in between to create iron oxide all by themselves. No outside energy re in required. So we learned about kinetics in a previous chapter, and kinetics is the science that deals with how fast processes occur. So um, we learned about uh, um, the order of reaction. We had first order reactions and second order reactions. But in general, we were looking at time. And if I started a reaction, I wanted to know how how much would be left after a certain time or how long a process might take. So when we're talking about kinetics, we're generally looking at um, this part of a reaction coordinate diagram. So remember a reaction coordinate diagram starts with the energy of the reactants. This the energy is on this axis. And um, as the reactants turn into products, we call that the reaction progress. 
So reaction progress is a lot like um, time, but uh, reaction progress can go forward. I can turn from reactants into products, and reaction process progress can also go backwards. I can turn the products can turn back into reactants because chemical processes are in theory reversible. Whether or not they are actually reversible um, depends on the actual positions of these. It depends on the equilibrium constant. Um, but it, we can't say that time is reversible. So you can imagine down here this is time because we turn from reactants to products or products to reactants. But although it's possible to reverse the reaction progress, I can't reverse time. That's why it's more appropriate to write the reaction coordinate or the reaction progress on this axis. So what we're really looking at is how does the energy of a reaction change over time? Well, the reactants have this much potential energy, and in order to turn from reactants to products, I have to go through what's called um, a transition state, or sometimes intermediates. So a transition state is the state that we reach at the top of the peak. Remember, and that's when bonds are partially formed and some bonds are partially broken. So to turn from reactants to products, I'm, I'm making and breaking bonds. At this state, in the transition state, this is when those bonds are partially formed and partially broken. Um, and so this, the, uh, the space from the bottom of the, the energy of the reactants to the top of this peak here, remember, is called the activation energy. So here, this is the activation energy, Ea. This is the transition state at the top of the peak here. And so kinetics says that when we have a higher activation energy, generally that step goes slow. And when I have a lower activation energy, that step goes fast. So when we're thinking about kinetics, we're really looking at this part of a reaction coordinate diagram. We're not so much concerned with the energy of the reactants or the energy of the products. We're mostly concerned with the energy of the transition state and the activation energy. Large activation energy is a slow reaction, and a small activation energy is a fast reaction. So um, when I'm looking at thermodynamics, I'm really looking at, I'm much more concerned with this right here. The, the difference between the um, potential energy of the reactants and the potential energy of the products. So thermodynamics um, tells whether a reaction is going to move forward or whether a reaction is going to move backward. Um, and it has to do with equilibrium. So how do we know if a reaction is going to move forward or backward? Uh, well, we already have one way of determining that, and that's when we look at Q versus K. Remember, we are given a set of, uh, of concentrations in a reaction, and the question might ask, is this reaction at equilibrium? Or the question might ask, what are the equilibrium concentrations if I start with one mole of this, one mole of this, and one mole of this? Well, in order to determine if the reaction moves forward or backward, we had to calculate Q and compare Q to K. So um, determining whether a reaction moves forwards or backwards, that's really the heart of spontaneity. Is, is this reaction going to occur in the forward direction all by itself without energy? Or is it going to occur in the reverse direction all by itself without energy? In which case, the forward direction would be non-spontaneous. So um, when we're thinking about thermodynamics, we're really thinking about whether a reaction moves forwards or backwards. And we've kind of thought about that before in terms of Q and K. So for example, um, this is a good way to think about the differences between kinetics and thermodynamics. Uh, we sometimes say diamonds are forever, right? And, that, and that's why we give diamonds to um, our fiancés or you know, our significant others, because a diamond is, is special because it lasts forever, just like our love, right? But that's not actually true. Diamonds don't last forever. In fact, diamonds are all turning into coal. So. A diamond is actually a less stable form of carbon. Remember, diamonds are pure carbon. And coal, or graphite, is also pure carbon. And this graphite is a more stable form of carbon than the diamond is. So that means that diamonds are slowly turning into coal. 
So a diamond is not forever. Given enough time, diamonds will all convert into graphite. The reason is because the diamond is has more energy, right? So we think about that. We think about the the ball on the hill. The diamond has more energy, and the graphite has less energy. So over time, given enough time, the ball is going to roll down the hill and end up over here. And graphite will not spontaneously turn into diamonds. In order for graphite to turn in, into diamonds, what has to happen? Well, remember these layers right here, look, there are separate flat layers here. Well, these flat layers have to get squeezed together, and when they get squeezed together, a bond can be made between the layers. And if bonds are made between the layers, then that creates diamonds. That's why diamonds are the hardest substance, because they have bonds between all the carbon atoms. But graphite just has bonds between three of the atoms, right? They're kind of in these flat sheets here. So the point is, uh, thermodynamically speaking, graphite is more stable than diamond. Um, and we'll talk about why, because you would think, well, wouldn't that extra bond make diamond more stable? And that it, you're, you're right in terms of its enthalpy. But there's something else we have to consider when we're thinking about um, thermodynamics, which is entropy. And so diamond is does have um, uh, is more enth enthalpically or in terms of enthalpy, diamond is more stable because that bond does stabilize diamond. But in terms of entropy, graphite has a higher entropy value because that bond is missing, and these these atoms can move relative to each other, which increases the entropy. So although graphite is more stable than diamond, so we're diamonds are are turning into graphite. If we think about the uh, if we think about the um, sorry, we have a situation that looks like this. Here's our diamonds, diamonds. And here's our graphite. So graphite is lower in energy, right? Not much, but a little bit lower in energy. So diamonds are turning into graphite slowly. But look at this part of our reaction coordinate diagram, right? Remember, this is energy and time. So here is my activation energy in order to turn diamond into graphite, which is thermodynamically favorable because graphite is more stable than diamond. But in order for that to happen, I have to break this bond. To turn this into this, all these bonds have to break. And for that to happen, look how much energy is required. So that is so that's such a high activation energy that we can calculate the time necessary right because kinetics has to do with how fast a reaction happens so if I know the activation energy I can say how long is it gonna take how what's the speed of this reaction well it turns out that the speed of the reaction for diamond to turn into graphite is longer than the entire history of the universe so although all diamond is turning into graphite thermodynamically it actually practically is not because it takes it would take so long for that to happen naturally that it doesn't occur at any at any practical time scale so when we say that diamonds are forever even though it's not technically true because they're turning into graphite it is practically true because that will take so 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 long that it's essentially forever it is a huge amount of time so it's important to consider the difference between thermodynamics, which tells us whether a process will occur in terms of its energy, whether it's, it's favorable to go in which direction, from diamond to graphite and not from graphite to diamond. But we need to consider both thermodynamics and kinetics if we're thinking about whether a process is actually going to happen. Because although this process is spontaneous, it's not actually going to happen because it would take so, so long. So uh, when a solid melts, the particles have more freedom of movement. So this is why graphite is more stable than uh, diamond. This freedom of movement of the particles 
is uh, captured in something that we call entropy. And freedom of movement is, is really important for, uh, it, uh, for thermodynamics, for the way that the universe operates. The second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy is always increasing, which means that the universe started in a very ordered state and as time, it, we'll say that's at the Big Bang, right? And then as time started and time moved forward, the universe is becoming more and more and more disordered. It started in a perfectly ordered state, and from then on out, it always has to become more and more disordered. So particles having more freedom of movement helps them to become more disordered, which helps to increase the entropy of the universe, which is required by the second law of thermodynamics. Some people think that because particles have to, because entropy has to increase, and that means that we can kind of say that processes are always going to occur in one direction and not the other. Some people think that this, this entropy is what gives our universe an arrow of time. It tells our universe which direction is forward. Because when we think about a lot of uh, physical equations and physical con um, constants, we can create the equations to move forward in time, and they give us answers that are just as reasonable if we move backward in time. So most of our equations, most of our physics equations, time, the direction of time is not important. It would seem as though forwards in time and backwards in time are equal when we look at a lot of the equations that physics gives us. But of course, to us, to humans, Forwards in time and backwards in time certainly do not seem equal because we have some kind of access to things that happened before. We call that our memory, right? We can, we can think of the things that happened in the past. We have no access to the things that happened in the future. That's why it's the future. It hasn't happened yet. So to humans, the direction of time seems like a very important concept, but in physics, it's uh, a lot of these equations seem to work forwards and backwards in the same way. But one place where that's not true is entropy. Entropy is always moving in one direction. We started in a perfectly ordered universe at the Big Bang, and after the Big Bang, things become more and more and more disordered. And so that might be where time comes from, this, this idea of entropy, this idea of disorder. So uh, when systems become more random, energy is released, and we'll talk about how in uh, a later video, and we call this energy entropy. So here in the solid ice, all the particles are stuck, right? Kind of like in diamond. They're all stuck together. None of them are moving. But when the ice melts, then the particles are able to move around a little bit, just like those, those layers of graphite can slide around because they're not bonded in the middle anymore. Well, these water molecules moving around creates more randomness, and that creates more entropy, and that causes that process to be spontaneous, um, melting spontaneous at certain temperatures. And so we can talk about why um, it's spontaneous at certain temperatures and not at other temperatures, and it has to do with the difference between enthalpy, which is the strength of all these bonds, and entropy, which is the randomness of the motion. So water evaporating is another example. Water uh, evaporating is spontaneous at certain, certain temperatures, certain conditions, because even though I'm breaking bonds, remember enthalpy is about making bonds and breaking bonds, all of these water molecules are bonded together very tightly with hydrogen bonds. In order for them to evaporate, I have to break bonds, breaking hydrogen bonds. Breaking hydrogen bonds takes energy. So how, if this process takes energy, how is it a process that occurs spontaneously? I thought spon spontaneity happened when a process occurred without energy. Well, even though it takes energy to break bonds and turn these particles into gas particles that are no longer bonded to each other, I am gaining an energy called entropy, this kind of energy of randomness. So particles that are moving around in liquid are random for sure, but particles that are moving around in a gas state are even more random. So solid is the least random, liquid is more random, and gas is the most random. So even though I'm breaking a bond which takes energy, which is unfavorable in terms of enthalpy, because I have to absorb energy to break that bond, 
I'm gaining some kind of energy that we call entropy, which which more than overcomes, more than compensates for the energy required to break the bond. And therefore, this process is spontaneous at certain temperatures. So when it's really, really cold, evaporation is less likely. And when it's really, really hot, evaporation is more likely. So entropy and how much energy we get, how much of this entropy we get, has something to do with the temperature. So these are the two factors that affect whether a reaction is spontaneous. And remember, spontaneous just means which direction does the reaction occur without a push? Which direction will the reaction go all by itself? Iron turns to rust, rust does not turn to iron. So there are two factors that determine whether a reaction is spontaneous. The enthalpy change, which is how much energy is required to break bonds, or how much energy do I get back when I make bonds? So enthalpy change is all about making and breaking bonds. And entropy change. And entropy change is how free are the particles to move? How random are they? How much room do they have to move around? So those two, those two properties, those two factors, are at play with each other. And sometimes they move in the same direction, which is that they're both causing that reaction to become more spontaneous. Sometimes they both move in the other direction where they're both causing a reaction to be less spontaneous. And sometimes they oppose each other where the enthalpy change is favorable, but the entropy change is not favorable. And so we have to think about how these two factors are at play when we determine whether a reaction is going to happen. Because we can't just say it's not as simple as all exothermic reactions occur spontaneously and all endothermic reactions are not spontaneous. Because when we think about exothermic, we have reactions where it looks like a ball rolls down the hill, right? And exothermic reactions are where we're losing heat. And so it's, it's tempting to say that all exothermic equals spontaneous. But endothermic reactions, where the ball has to roll up the hill, in terms of H, in terms of enthalpy, that endo is non-spontaneous. It's tempting to say that because we make these similar paths. But when I'm talking about um, exothermic and the ball rolling down the hill, I'm only talking about H. I'm only talking about enthalpy. And so yes, it's favorable in terms of enthalpy for the ball to roll down the hill. This is a good situation in terms of enthalpy this is the non-spontaneous situation in terms of enthalpy, but we can't only consider enthalpy when we're considering whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. We have to also think about entropy. So this is a, entropy is a mysterious kind of concept, and we've thought about exothermic and endothermic before. Heat exiting, heat entering, the ball rolling down the hill, the ball rolling up the hill. So heat, breaking bonds, making bonds, this kind of stuff we've thought about before. Entropy is totally new, and we haven't really thought about that before. So we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about entropy and talking about entropy and thinking about how it relates to the enthalpy and how those two factors determine whether a reaction is spontaneous or not.